Seven slaughters. More like seven farters. Seriously, we haven't recorded in months, and this is the best joke you can come up with? Okay, okay, okay. How about this joke? You're listening to Merc with the Podcast, episode 133. Ooh. listening to Mark with the podcast episode 133 i am your bird brain nest host corwin and with me is my shiny man's head in hulk's mouth co-host scott Gah! the Merc with the podcast is your monthly slave view of all things deadpool which is sometimes published by marvel comics you can file your Merc report to us on facebook under Merc with the podcast Merc w a podcast on twitter slash x or email us at hipster Dokken, H-I-P-S-T-E-R-D-A-K-E-N, at gmail.com, and Patch will send us your hell house facts. <laughs> it still makes me laugh every single time I see our email address. Why? <laughs> it's a joke that will never get old. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, we have a lot to get through today. Do we really? Yes. Time for the news. Let's start with the news. Time for the news nobody pays attention to. Okay, so what is the news that nobody pays attention to? What's going on in the world of Deadpool? We have six items to regurgitate that are credible. <laughs> okay. Item number one. Uh, SAG after approves deal to end historic strike. This is by G. Mattis over at Variety. Yes, we haven't recorded in so long, we didn't cover the actor strike. All right, we haven't recorded since October, so yes, two two months. Two months Gene writes, the SAG after negotiate, uh, negotiators have approved a tentative agreement that will end the longest actor strike against the film and TV studios in Hollywood history. In the announcement Wednesday, the union said that the 118-day strike would officially end at 12.01 a.m. on Thursday. The union's negotiation committee approved the deal in a unanimous vote. The agreement next goes to SAG after national board for approval on Friday. The two uh, days spent the last... The two sides spent the last several days putting the finishing touches on the deal, which sees the first ever uh, protections for actors against artificial intelligence, a historic pay increase. The deal will see most minimus increase by 7%, 2% above the increase received by the Writers Guild in America and the Directors Guild of America. And there's also going to be uh, Gene Wright's, there's going to also be a, a streaming participation. They're way late with that one. Yes, yeah, uh, here we go. The deal also includes a streaming participation bonus according to email sent to sag after members and will increase the pension and health contributions. The union said the contract is worth more than $1 billion in total. Okay. Well, yay. We're, we're set back months and months with uh, movies and TV shows because of the two strikes, so 2024 is going to be pretty lean it i mean yeah but we're starting to see things like come back and at least for television just yeah. clamoring all coming back all at once now because i believe cbs they're having their official season launch next month with the super bowl okay and then I think ABC is going to have their official launch with the Oscars. Okay. Well, I know with Marvel and stuff, it's like one thing, one movie this year, I think. It's, everything's kind of been delayed with them especially. So we will see how it all works out. Well, Corwin, perfect segue. Marvel's Deadpool 3 moves to July 2024 and Captain America Brave New World to 2025 as Disney shakes up schedules due to actor strike. This is written by uh, Anthony D. Alessandro over at Deadline. 
as we told you Wednesday, Disney's Marvel's uh, Double Three is moving off its summer launch date of March 3rd, 2024, leaving this season without a kickout film for now. The Sean Levy directed pick, which is going back into production, will take over Captain America's Brave New World uh, release date of July 26th next year, er, which is now this year. <laughs> <laughs> but Captain America won't be kicking off the summer. He's moving to February 14th, 2025. We, uh, we had heard that Captain America was in better shape than Deadpool 3 and the latter 50% complete and brave new worlds would be uh, the fire off the summer. Nope, not happening. Happening Valentine's day cap fans to make room. Disney moved Marvel studios blade from February 4th, 2025 to November 7th that year. Marvel Sun uh, Thunderbolt, which didn't even start production due to the dual strikes now goes from December 20th, 2024 to July 25th, 2025. And uh, just me adding a note here, Stephen Yun has left that project. Uh, more moves by Disney include Mufasa, the Lion King sequel, going from July 5th to December 20th, 2024. Disney has also scrubbed uh, from the schedule two untitled movies on July 25th, 2025, and November 7th, 2025. Today's moves could set the table for more release calendar changes as other studios jostle for position as SAG after members prepare to return for work. Sony, which controls rights as Marvel Spider-Man Universe on Wednesday, moved its 2024 spin-off threequel Venom, Let There Be Carnage, from July 14th to November 8th. What? You said let there be carnage. Yeah, they're saying uh, it's the spin-off threequel Venom Let There Be Carnage. The, I think they're saying the sequel to, to Let There Be, okay, there be gotcha. Carnage. Okay, yeah. Movie, and that's going to November 8th now. Yeah. They Did they rename Captain America? Did they announce the name of the new name for the Captain America? Or was, was it Brave, it's Brave New World? World? What was it before? New, New World, World Order. Order. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, well. Yeah. Well, glad things are back up and running and hopefully, you know, people getting paid what they deserve and them damn AI protections will stick because there was some ridiculous stuff the, the I thought to say producers, but the production companies are trying to pull or the, you know, the big companies are trying to pull ridiculous and corwin perfect segue we have some news about ai great skynet is launched <laughs> okay what's the news this uh comes from bleeding cool many comic book artists name as being used by mid journey this is written by rich johnson a class action copyright lawsuit was first filed almost a year ago in the Northern District of California, targeted uh, stability AI mid-journey in DeviantArt for the uses of AI-generative imagery. Now, a list of 16,000 artists have been included as part of an amendment and the submissions of 455 page of supplementary evidence filed last year. is meant to include the artists whose work used to develop mid-journey's AI art offering. They include comic book creators such as Tim Bradstreet, Alejandro Jaworski, Art Spiegelman, Brian Bolin, Bill Sienkiewicz, Bill Watterson, Bill Willingham, Ben Templesmith, Adi Granoff, Al Davison, Alex Toff, Arthur Rackman, Arthur Seiden, Scott McCloud, Ryan North, Mort Drucker, Mike Dringenberg, Frank Miller, Frank Frazetta, Frank Hampton, Neil Gaiman, Mike McNulla, Alejandro Jaworski. I don't know why he was named twice in this. Bill Griffith, <laughs> Brian Talbot, Dan DiCarlo, Dave Gibbons, George Pratt, James Obar, James Kochach, John, Br John Byrne, Dave Sim, Albert Uderes, Wally Wood, Walt Kelly, Jack Kirby, Steve Dicko, Steve Dillon, Dave McCade, uh, Kashuro Ottoman, Milton Caniff, Ronald Searles, Simon B Bisley, Jeff Smith, Dave Dorman, John Bolton, and more. I was going to say, you're really going to name like all of them, but okay. Well, I was just naming the comic book artists. Got you. Which many of them are actually not living anymore either, but yeah, their estates, I guess. 
Oh, you want me to? I can read no. every. <laughs> no, no, that's not. <laughs> every single artist this thing has mentioned. But yeah, I was just reading there. But uh, yeah. Here's the argument. Just hear me out. I'm not defending AI. Mm -hmm. But you need, to, if you want to teach a kid to draw or teach a person to draw, you need to show them art so they can learn how to draw and develop a style. Okay. Hence, you have to show them art of artists so they can learn how to draw art <laughs> art you get what i'm trying to get at i got you yeah i understand yeah so it, it, it's i understand that yeah people are saying hey this is my style you're copying off of my style but you know how is that any different from uh yeah somebody going oh i really like you know I've read a bunch of Rob Liefeld comics. I'm going to start drawing just like Rob Liefeld because I like that style. You might add your own twist, but you're still copying Rob Liefeld's style. I think when it comes down to the AI, it's they're using, yes, they're using people's art to train the AI without their permission. So that is where I think there is a difference. And I think the biggest issue we have to worry about is, of course, replacing artists completely with AI. That's where I think the problem's falling into things. But right now, in order for them to do that, I think they should be getting permission or paying people for that. Well, it, it's like uh, right now that OpenAI is being sued by uh, the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Because basically OpenAI is taking articles from the New York Times, giving it to you. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's like we have an agreement for Google to take us, you know, to take you to a New York Times article. But what you're doing is you're blindly just giving people, you know, an article. Access you just, to the article, you, yeah. Yeah, you were saying like, hey, give me a, uh, the article about – I'm just using – because we're on this article right now about the many comic artists named by, you know, the lawsuit for Mid Journey. And it's giving me – yeah, the thing by, written by the New York Times. Well, New York Times is like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Let alone, and then you're training your AIs to write like a New York Times writer. Yeah. And talking about writer segue. <laughs> it's not a segue if you use segue. <laughs> but yes, what's what's next? Fuck, I, uh... You close the window? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right-click, reopen, close tab. Oh, is that how you do it? If you're using Chrome, yeah. Just go on the toolbar away from any of the tabs and right-click. Or Control-Shift-T, as in Tom. Hey, 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 thank you. I never knew that. <laughs> Talking about uh, writers... We have a new error Deadpool finds the Merc with the mouse in Death's Grip. This is a press press release by Marvel. Um, is this is this a kind of grip that Deadpool wants from Death, or is this something else? Just ahead of the return of the big screen next year, Marvel's most iconic mercenary, mercenary will headline a brand new solo ongoing comic book series. Hitting stands in April, Deadpool will be written by Cody Ziegler, known for his acclaimed work on Miles Morales' Spider-Man, and drawn by... Roger Antonio? Thank you! Assume... The artist behind some of Venom and Carnage's bloodiest recent adventures. Together, they'll take readers and wade gun blazing into a new age packed with Deadpool's specific, uh, Pacific brand of violence and lunacy along with heavy dose of deadly family drama. In addition to a brand new arch enemy named Death Grip, who may very well live up to his name, the series will also feature Deadpool's daughter Ellie in a pivotal role. It's a father-daughter duo from the Marvel Universe isn't ready for. And if Death Grip ha has his way, it'll only lead to heartbreak. Hmm. Okay, they're bringing Ellie back. So that's kind of cool. We haven't seen her since the uh, free comic book day last year when the Sentinels showed up at uh, their house. What's her name? What's the uh, Washington? What's the 
former shield agent that she's staying with the family she's living with preston preston yeah we haven't seen her since the sentinel showed up at their door so maybe this is going to tie into that possibly Well, I mean, you you can kind of see where this might be going. If they kill Ellie, then Ellie will just come back to life. Well, I mean, most people don't know that what her powers are, but yeah, it's possible. But actually, uh, has her has her powers even kicked in yet? Has is she old enough? Well, her powers doesn't even kick in until she dies. Or I mean, doesn't she have to hit puberty? Is it that kind of thing where she has to hit puberty first, or? I mean, do we know no, 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 no. If, if I remember correctly mm-hmm. from the Jerry Duggan run, whatever that dude's name was, the one who was programming Deadpool and everything, I think he said Ellie was born a mutant. Okay. Because remember, he was technically raising Ellie. Mm-hmm. I know it's been a very yeah, long time. Yeah, but he was actually raising Ellie. So I'm saying that I remember that that doctor like had Ellie's blood samples and Ellie was actually born with the X gene. I just guess this is what I'm just theorizing that when she dies, mm-hmm. that it'll be the set point of when she comes back. So if she dies at, let's just say, 14, mm-hmm. for now on, whenever she dies, she comes back as a 14 year old. Oh, that'll suck. Well, we saw that with the 2099, Nine. remember? Yeah. She, like, got fossilized or whatever, and then when she broke free of, like, her ectoskeleton, she was back to, like, a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> it suck, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she's one of the rare cases where she was born a mutant. Born with her egg gene active. Got you. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember. It's been a while, but... Yeah, I, I, I think we got that... Probably, I think we got that in the, the, in one of the, uh, when it was, when Deadpool actually killed his parents. Remember that, in that flashback issue? It took place in the 90s with Sabretooth? Yes, in the house, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and I believe there is when uh, Dr. Dr. Plot Device, (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Dr. Plot Device, uh, said, it's like, yeah, he had like a sample of like Ellie's blood. It's like, oh, she's a pure mutant. Okay. Uh, What about this uh, creative team? I know nothing of them, so. Um, I don't remember. I never read Cody Ziegler's stuff, I don't think. Now, did he work? On the She-Hulk TV show or the She-Hulk comic? I only thing I remember from was didn't he do with Miles Morales, Spidey? Yeah, but also work on Robot Chicken and She-Hulk. Oh, so then it must have been a TV show because Rainbow. Oh God, no! Th- oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> Rainbow, Rainbow Row, I think was was the one doing the uh, the book for She-Hulk. No, the She-Hulk, the She-Hulk TV show was cool. It was funny. I enjoyed it. Oh, oh it that terrible. was not, that was not not good. I liked it. And no, I haven't watched Echo yet. I haven't even finished What If season two yet. Neither have I. They haven't been that great, to be honest with you. Um, what What If or Echo? What, I haven't finished What If. I did watch Echo. Echo is eh, eh, averageish. Um, the best thing I could say about it is, of course, they really. They kind of touch into the whole Native American culture and, you know, um, go in, lean into that a little bit. So it's, you know, you get to see their culture and their culture shine. So I think that's probably the best thing about it. Other than that, it's just an average crime story. It, it's not fantastic. Um, and I think it just loses it. Like most of these things, it starts out good and kind of tweet peters out towards the end yeah no no i want i want to watch echo oh did he talking kind of segue with echo did you see the rumor of who might be coming back uh no uh foggy and and deborah ann wool's character okay um because they're they totally scrapped daredevil so they're just restarting all over again 
they scrapped the plan. So yeah, are, are they doing well, they a scra- reboot they... or? Well, no, I meant they scrapped the four episodes they already shot. shot. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, apparently it's going. It's like, oh yeah, they're bringing them back now. Okay. I mean, which is like, because I don't think we talked about it, but good. From what I heard, that Daredevil show was going to be terrible. Yeah, I don't know. It, it was going to just be more like procedural base in the courtroom. Hmm. And it wasn't until episode four he finally donned the suit. Yeah, that's too late. Oh, so Cody Ziegler does have a. Uh, we'll be covering one of his stories in the uh, Seven Slaughters book. He did have a story in there. Yeah, he, 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 this uh, case isn't helping him. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and talking about rumors of movies, uh, Ryan Reynolds leaks hilarious Deadpool 3 spoilers. Oh, is this the fake stuff? The fake spoilers? Yes. Okay. <laughs> This is Ryan Leston over at IGN. Dipple 3 star Ryan Reynolds has dropped his own hilarious leak from the set. The actor posted an image uh, from set of the upcoming Dipple sequel on X Twitter that showed him himself and Hugh Jackman having a pleasant chat with Predator. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Dipple's asking people, you know, stop with the leaks. Or <laughs> make Photoshop leaks and spam the tag. I saw one with an Ant Man standing in the group and some other craziness. I like the one where Mickey Mouse and Dimples holding the bag of money. <laughs> I didn't see that one. I've kind of avoided it all, but <laughs> that's funny. All right. I'm sending you the link. Hold on. I mean, here. As I said, we're uh, we're not going to discuss leaks on the show. We no. will post leaks on the Facebook and the Twitter because we want traffic for people to know about this show. Because that would be great. <laughs> if we could actually get listeners. Yeah, I'll check them out later. But, uh, I mean, did you see... We won't say what the leak is, but did you see the actual real leak? No. Recently? No, I've completely avoided those things. On oh, purpose. I saw I saw it. That'll be cool when it comes. <laughs> Why is Hugh Jackman's stunt double like a foot taller than him? <laughs> or is that even real? No, that's real. Uh, the stunt double thing. Yeah, it's like his Keep jack- scro- Yeah, scroll to the next picture. The bag of money. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Mouse <laughs> clapping in the background. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this construction one? I can't make it out. Q. Oh no! Oh no! No no! That that's the that's the real one. Oh, that's the real one. What the hell are they trying to spell? I can't even tell what that thing is. All right. Anyway. Oh, I don't know. I oh, I think that's. Oh no, that's Quiznos. Because <laughs> remember, it, it's the fox. Twentieth mm-hmm. century fox sign, but he changed that one to Quiznos. Quiznos. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the bag of money is probably the best one. All right, and uh, and then we have our final news item, which is a sad one. Uh, Amazon is officially killing the Comic Allergy app, forcing users over to Kindle. Oh yeah, that happened in December. Everybody's <laughs> okay. You know what? Carmen? <laughs> Everybody's pissed we about it. We haven't recorded for a while, and I thought this was important. Yes, it is because it's been truly terrible. Like the whole Kindle app. Everybody's just complaining how terrible it is um, trying to use the comic, Comixology app on it or, the, you know, read comics on it. So, Oh, yeah. We'll get into that when we uh, review a certain book. Uh, this is written by Cheyenne McDonald over at Engadget. Amazon has begun notifying com- Comicology users that they will no longer be able to read comics on the app come December 4th. Comicology is merging with the Kindle app, and users' libraries will soon only be accessible uh, via the latter. The move caps off the ruination of Comicology that began nearly two years ago when Amazon started chipping away at the platform's native features and general usability in order to uh, force a fit when it's uh, within its own ecosystem. And as you said, well, I mean, I understand that 
it, it, it is a pain to buy things on Kindle because you can't do it on mobile. You have to <laughs> go to a website to buy something. It's just the interface too. I mean, oof. I, I I tried it once. And I'm not even gonna bother. Oh, all right. And not even bothering. Do you want to get into the books, let's, or do you want to get into con report? Oh, let's do the con report real quick. <laughs> it's not going to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so people know, uh, I went to NecoCon last year, back in November. I presented two panels. But before that, we should talk about what happened at NecoCon. How my car died on the bridge. Oh, Lord, yeah. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> and what exactly was wrong with it? Uh, no, my car battery just died. Your battery, okay. Uh, the funny part though, <laughs> when I called to get the tow truck and the guy's like, uh, are you going to be staying with your vehicle? Because, you know, I'm now pushed off to the side. I'm like, well, you know, I was thinking about going for a swim, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> uh, there's not really anywhere else I can be going right now. <laughs> uh, it's only like a what? How many story drop? <laughs> <laughs> a very big drop. <laughs> yeah, so after, you know, getting the car towed and a new battery and everything, that costs about $500. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but thankfully, you know, everything was nearby. But, uh, yeah, so that was off to the best. Then I was, uh, so I had to get my badge. So I got my badge. Well, yeah, so that morning, first off that morning, I had to go get a lift to pick up my car, got my car, drove it, you know, and then I drove straight to the convention center. Then I had to wait in, you know, the longest one hour line to get my badge because I couldn't do it preview night. I get my badge and then I'm like, okay, I'll just go to the room where my panel is going to be because I still have an hour to kill. So when I go to load up my panel... Mm -hmm. it's not on my computer because I have it saved to the one cloud drive. Uh oh. So I'm like, shit. Okay. This should be easy. I'll just log on to the Wi-Fi. <laughs> guess who, guess what doesn't have free Wi-Fi <laughs> or Wi-Fi. You can pay for the not convention for? center. Not even the you... one you can pay for. No, oh, that's ass backwards. And my hotel, I'm like, shit, you know, if I get by the time I get to the hotel, download it and get back. I'm like, I'll just go to the hotel next door. Clearly, the hotel should have free Wi-Fi in its lobby, Corwin. Of course not. Of course not. Well, they want you to pay or be a patron. No. Uh, then I tried to go near the Starbucks there. Of course, that's so that the hotel Starbucks doesn't have free Wi-Fi either. So the so world now, is set out against you. <laughs> oh, th this week to begin with was not a good week. Even with work that week, I was like, oh my God. So I'm trying my best. So like, I'm trying to like, you know, do the whole tether thing for my phone's Wi-Fi, you know, hotspot. Not working. So then like a crack attic, <laughs> I go up to this random woman in the lobby and I'm like, I have a panel in like five minutes. Can you please just log into the hotel Wi-Fi so I can download my panel? Aww. And she's like, uh, yeah, sure. So she logs in. It starts downloading. Finished downloading. I run out of there. <laughs> like it's a bomb scare. <laughs> Get to the panel with two minutes to spare. And I used to talk to the guy running in the room. I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you know, like I had to download the panel. And guess what he says? He has the internet password. He's like, oh, yeah, we have a wire Ethernet cable in here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, huh. Well, according to you know, the agreement that I had to sign for, you said, why, yo, internet will not be provided. You guys are liars. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, you poor bastard. <laughs> okay. So yeah, then you so, get everything going in now, and then? Okay, yeah, so, you know, I present the panel. The panel goes fine. Uh, you know, I, that panel was a beginner's guide to anime. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, you know, a decent turnout. And then I'm like, hey, any questions, comments? No. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> we have 10 minutes to spare. <laughs> we have, like... 10 minutes to spare here's a clip of the simpsons so i just play a clip of the simpsons as people are walking out and this guy comes up to me and uh so in the panel i basically make a dig at gundam saying gundam sucks oh lord Uh uh-huh this guy was not happy about it took it personally (laughs) yes and i'm like dude it's a fucking joke how old would you say he was Maybe in his early 30s. Okay, so he's a grown-up. Not, yeah. Not like a 16-year-old. No. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. And then uh, he didn't know about the thing I was saying with the licensing agreement. You know, like how you can actually not stream the original Full Metal Alchemist anywhere. Oh, you can't find it? Really? It's at least within the United States. It's not streaming. If you have like a Japanese Netflix, you can stream it. Got you. And apparently he was also telling me that the reason why there's so many other shows, like why Funimation is still around right now. Uh Because you know how like there's still Funimation, there's still Crunchyroll, even though they're moving everything over to Crunchyroll. It deals with contracts that were like when Funimation bought certain things, they can't move it to another platform. Oh, damn. So basically, the Funimation, like, you know, streaming service is going to be around for, like, maybe another, like, eight years or so. Till that contract or whatever is up. Yeah, until the contract is up, and then they can finally just move everything to uh, Crunchyroll. But yeah, Funimation is slowly but surely dying. Hmm. You, you, um, have you jumped on High Dive yet? No. Okay. Yeah, which pisses me off because apparently that's the only place where Chain Soldiers is streaming. Mm-hmm. Eminence and Shadow. I mean, they got some. They got some bangers on there. I gotta give it to them. Yeah, but I also heard it's not a great service. Like the content on it, like it doesn't have much. Right, right. It yeah, but they've got some um, exclusives that are pretty damn good. So, uh, yeah. So then I do the panel that night at. One o'clock in the fucking morning. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and as I said, when I do PTSD in anime, either I open up a convention with it or Very I close, close the convention with it. And let me tell you something people in that room <laughs> were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is exactly the crowd you expect to have at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Needless to say, I had to play the uh, Yo Shinji get in the robot <laughs> music video twice because apparently it was that damn popular <laughs> with drunk <Trump> people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, other than that, uh, you know, I went to a bunch of eighteen plus panels. I went to a rave. Oh, this is another thing. So I get done the rave, and I'm like, I am so thirsty. It's not funny. So I'm like, and I am also so hot. I'm going to get like a nicey. So I drive right near my hotel. There's a Wawa. I go there. It's closed. I have never seen a closed 24-hour Wawa. Yeah. Did they have a fire? I don't know. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, I'll go to 7-Eleven. Yeah, put in the GPS. I drive there. There's not even a building. The building has been (laughs) condemned. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, let's try this again. If this 7-Eleven isn't there... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then I'm just going to dehydrate to death. 
So I get there, I get a Slurpee, and then I get like the, like a fucking two gallon chunk of water, <laughs> and I fucking chug that shit. Okay. Needless to say, I did not go to the convention Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> By this point, it's like four in the morning. I'm like, no, fuck this. I'm not going. <laughs> okay. So needless to say, Nenko Khan <laughs> kicked my ass this year. So how was the rave? Oh, the rave is always great. Of course, there, you know, there was the inflatable dancing go. <laughs> T-Rex there. Oh, funny thing. There's a show on Netflix called The Brother's Son, S-U-N. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an action comedy thing. It's fantastic. Michelle Yeoh's in it, but there's a scene at a birthday party where assassins come in dressed in those dinosaur inflatable dinosaur costumes, and they're all fighting with swords in the costumes. <laughs> Pretty awesome. It's a great show, though. You can definitely check that one out. But uh, yeah, no. So that was Necrocon, and that was my last year at presenting. Um, not my last year. Last that is time. last time I will be going to Necocon for a while. Aww. Well, just because of vacation days and everything. So, yeah, yeah I want to take other vacations. But talking about, you know, presenting at conventions, let me bring up that email. Oh, Lord. Uh, Merc with the podcast will be at SetsuCon. Yay. But aren't you there every year? Yes, but this is the second year we'll be presenting, Continue. Corwin. Got you. Well, what, yes. city, what city is this in? <laughs> Middle of nowhere, bum, Bumblefuck, Alabama, Pennsylvania. Is <laughs> <laughs> Al- Altoona, Pennsylvania. Okay. Corwin, you can, I'm probably the richest person there because I have a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Even back... <laughs> My dad, when my dad was in college, he knew somebody from Altoona. And even back then, they were known for their biggest export was uh, drift, <laughs> drifting depression. <laughs> okay. Listeners, anyway. make sure you <laughs> address Corwin, your concerns to Scott. <laughs> they don't have internet there. <laughs> they get their news by caveman. Uka, uka. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I draw I draw cave painting on the wall. <laughs> aye, aye. Okay. Orange blob president. <laughs> anyway, uh yes, yeah, so Fr- Setsukan will be February second through February fourth. But <clears throat> I will be presenting no really blank is good re zero edition on Friday, February 2nd from five 15 to six 15. And then on February 4th, Sunday, I will pre- be presenting slice life, alien witches and love triangles from 10 AM to 11 AM. And which I wonder which animes you're talking about in that one. I don't know, maybe one that we're talking about on this show, which we should be talking about the books. Yes, indeed. Let's go over the books. Buy is a party time fruit liquor. A browse is a point one. And a burn is a batter, <laughs> bladder blood. And the gentleman's decoy is a low point one. The, the yes. gentleman's decoys do not exist anymore. <laughs> All right, so up first, we have It's Jeff! Issues 25 through 30. That's right, It's Jeff has come back. So, issue 25, uh, Jeff C. Jeff. Uh, He's sleeping on the couch, Kate Bishop says, Let's go on a vacation. Jeff starts daydreaming, and he's (laughs) he's wearing a little hat (laughs) with his suitcase. And a Hawaiian shirt as he's going to the airport. Then he's just sitting there adorably on the plane, looking out the window. He gets his food, and first he eats the bread, and then he eats the whole plate. <laughs> then he's watching uh, killer, 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 Venom Killer Whale no, eating it's, ice. It's Venom Jeff. There's a Venom Jeff now in the Venom verse. Oh, Venom Jeff with the ice cream. 
<laughs> then he <laughs> walks out of the bathroom. <laughs> Walking down the steps, uh, then a crate comes over, and who's in the crate but it's Kate Bishop <laughs> and Jeff pats her head, and Kate and Jeff go, "Yeah, let's do this vacation." And then Jeff starts measuring Kate <laughs> to see if she'll fit. What size crates can get her? <laughs> <laughs> Written by Kelly Thompson and Arpin Chiro Hero. This this is a party time for oh, most definitely, most definitely. Keep going. All right. Up next, we have issue 26, uh, self-cleaning. Gwenpool is putting plates in the dishwasher. Jeff is licking his mouth because he actually wants to eat the stuff on the plates. But Gwenpool, she closes the dishwasher, runs it, and Jeff is like, no, no, the food. Uh, Then he... Here next day, he hears that uh, Gwen is doing the dishes again. So Jeff quickly <laughs> jumps into the dishwasher so he can uh, <laughs> lick all the dishes. And he's like, hey, 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 hey. Gwen pull closes it, runs it. <laughs> she opens it up, pulls it out, and there's Jeff all shiny and clean. And all the dishes are clean too, and he's snoring. <laughs> Written by Kelly Thompson, the Jimmy Hero. Uh, party time, fruit liquor. Definitely. Issue 27. We have Shark Man. Uh, Jeff and Gwen are building snowmen. Jeff builds his. <laughs> and it's cute and adorable. But Gwen, you know, she builds an even bigger one, spray paints a pink. Jeff gets mad. So Jeff starts building these extravagant uh, snow things. Gets Gwen all covered in snow and what does Je- jeff happen to make a giant shark about to eat her snowman <laughs> <laughs> this was written by kelly thompson in art bo- art by now fuji yeah the art is good it's very similar to gear hero it's got some differences but it's still solid so. uh this is still a part-time fruit liquor oh this was great issue 28 <laughs> Uh, we have travel size. I don't think I read this one. No, I read this one. Okay. So, uh, Kate is going away. Jeff does the typical thing that like cats do, which is <laughs> sit on the suitcase full of clothes. Uh, Kate's like, no, Jeff, you can't do it. She says, no, Jeff walks away all sad. Uh, she even pets Jet, uh, Jeff as she leaves. Jeff, uh, she Jeff put, looks at her through the window as she's loading her suitcase into the taxi. And she looks at the window. And she's like, oh, I can't believe I'm leaving Jeff. She looks out the plane window. She gets to the hotel, you know, opens up her suitcase and Jeff jumps out. Kate's surprised. And then Kate and Jeff are just sitting on the bed with room service. Watching TV. Written by Kelly Thompson and now Fuji. Uh, uh Part of time fruit liquor, of course. Yeah. Issue 29. Jeff on ice. Uh, Jeff has four ice skates on and he's trying to get on the ice to uh, skate. He's not having a good time. He sees somebody, you know, all these people doing Yuri on ice. He takes off all his, uh, ice skates and just sits there and watches everybody when all of a sudden a dog goes through some thin ice jeff goes oh no the dog falls through the thin ice jeff runs swims gets the dog brings the dog back to shore everybody's happy and petting jeff the hero <clears throat> written by kelly thompson and uh, and art by now fuji party time fruit liquor and then we have our final one issue 30 parade escapade Jeff is sleeping. Uh, we see a Spider-Man balloon fly by. Jeff's like, huh, what the hell was that? And then all of a sudden, uh, a MODOK one flies by. Jeff looks at it, thinks nothing of it. And then he's like, oh, a giant MODOK. And he starts barking at it. <laughs> Gwen's like, oh, no, Jeff, don't do it. Jeff jumps out the window, jumps on top of the giant MODOK, uh, bites it, <laughs> it deflates. 
then Jeff uh, flies right back into the window. Gwenpool catches him. And then we see a Jeff the Shark <laughs> parade f- balloon eating <laughs> the mouth. <clears throat> Written by Kelly Thompson and art by now Fuji. Party time fruit liquor. Yeah. These stories are great. They're just, you know, wholehearted fun. My, my youngest loves them. Talking about things not great. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? Really? That harsh? Yeah. That harsh? Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll take it one story at a time. Um, we've got Deadpool, the Seven Slaughters, number one. More like Seven Farters. Well, the first one is Possibilities, written by Colin Bunn, art by Philip Sevy, and colors by Guru FX. So in this story, Deadpool is escaping from some secret villain base with a scientist in tow um the scientist is researches on multiple or alternate realities so as deadpool's you know shooting his way fighting his way out he's you know um imagining alternate realities uh first one is him (laughs) in a symbiote suit with black widow and spider-man following behind well that that that's like going back to the back in black right well story that bond wrote yep Sort of, yeah. Similar. Um, Well, that one, yes. The next one is uh, him with the Legion of Monsters, which I don't remember if Morbius was around for that one, but I could be wrong. But yeah, he's just having different alternate realities that he's he's imagining. There's a rugby one where all the superheroes and supervillains are actually just rugby players. Um, We get the zombie apocalypse version with him fighting on Romero Drive. I don't know if you caught that. That was a nice little touch there. Um, we have a Deadpool and Daddies as, as a D and D game with him, Cable, Negasonic, Bob, and Wolverine playing D and D, which is really silly. Um, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe is another one which he actually mentions that he didn't like. <laughs> he saw and he didn't like. Um, and then there's another one with him just being normal. And by the time they get to the end of it, Deadpool pulls his gun on the scientist, and the scientist is like, "Well, why did you even, you know?" fight to get me out if you're just gonna kill me that was like you know maybe i was bored maybe i was hoping the guards would kill you or maybe just wanted someone to talk to and maybe there's a reality where i didn't pull the trigger and then he shoots him. He's like nah you didn't like this one nah this was a point one it was okay i'll, I'll give this one a gentleman's decoy all right, so the next one is Tuesday by Justina Ireland and Greg Land. Um, and colors by Frank DiMarta. Yes, and colors by Frank DiMarta. Somewhere in Central America, Deadpool is going through the jungle with who he calls... Uh, Ken. Uh, uh, what did he call him? Not just Ken. Wasn't he like Merc Ken or... Mercenary Ken. Or something like that. Yeah, just making fun of him as being a Ken doll. So the two of them go upon this... Uh, mansion in the middle of the thing and there's no security guards it's just a bunch of babes in at the pool Deadpool's like okay something's going on here and as he approaches all the babes end up being androids whose arms transfer to guns <laughs> Deadpool tells Ken to take cover which he doesn't quite do and he gets shot up and then Deadpool has to fight his way through the android bikini models when he gets into the mansion um, he meets the person in charge who's, you know, a millionaire who's doing research with androids and AI. His secretary, his second in command is an android AI who's actually the one um, who hired Deadpool to kill this guy because he was using the AIs as assassins and she wasn't cool with that. So Deadpool kills the dude and story ends with uh, <laughs> the AI saying, you know, she's going to become an English teacher to help better the world. Or, you know, destroy it. And, um, then, and, and then it ends with Deadpool going, Aliza AI didn't write this. Yeah. This is yeah, a... You know what? This is also a gentleman's decoy. decoy. If, it, if it was not for that last line, I would have given it a point one. Really? Even with the art? I don't mind Greg Clan. <sighs> Some of it. This is better than what we usually get from Land. I don't. I don't like the way he drives Deadpool's head and eyes. Just. Uh. 
Up next, we have Lady Anime. Story and art by Rob Liefeld, script by Chad Browsers, and color art by Romula Fajardo Jr. Is Chad, like, Deadpool's, like, handler? Is he the one who's, like, supposed to rein in Rob? Because <clears throat> he's always doing a script for Rob's stories for some reason. No, it's nope. probably just because Rob's not very good at... <laughs> Scripting? He can do the story, but he can't do the script? Okay. Well, this story is in a little Tokyo historic district in Los Angeles where Deadpool said he's been banned from. But basically, he goes to kill a informant who sells information... Once he does it, in comes... I'm not sure if I can pronounce this right. Ziaza? Lady Anime Zanaya? Ziaza? X-I-X-A? I I don't care. Okay. So, she's there. She's there to get some information from the informant dude. And she's pissed that Deadpool kills her. So, of course, they fight. And her power is hard lights. So, she reveals her true self, which is basically an anime-looking character. Um, and then she's fighting Deadpool and she turns him into an anime character too and she kind of kicks his butt and then leaves him a note telling him to stay out of Tokyo because not everybody's as fun as her. Bladder blood. This is just... uh, (laughs) This is a batter blood. Do you think Rob Liefeld purposely wrote this and tried to maybe appeal to you and I to <laughs> just talk good about him? Because <laughs> he's like, it's anime! Scott and Corwin don't like this! I mean, the premise is not bad. Just the execution. It's just, uh I mean, even the art... Mm, I mean, no. his art style changed! <laughs> some, of it's, what? some of it's cool. I'll, I'll give them that. So It's not all the way bad. Some of it's cool. He's drawing feet. Uh-huh. Joke, joke. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, I just, mm-mm, I don't know. I, I didn't dig it at all. The story's trying to be original, a little different, but I don't know. What, what, what would you say the major problems with this? I, the writing. Okay. Lack of backgrounds, a lot of, lack of a lot of backgrounds. Uh, yeah, that too. But my main thing is, it's just, well, I, it's not even Chad here with the writing. It's the writing for all this. I, I just sat here and I had trouble concentrating, paying attention to any of the stories. Like this, this whole thing was just so bad. Hmm. Well, let's keep going. Cause I don't, I don't think I agree with you with most of that. Next story. Up next, Walking Papers by Cody Ziegler. Art by Fadrisa Mansion and color by Brian Valnez. So in this one, Deadpool takes a job um, to get some information out of some war-torn country. Um, and he's killing his way through some mercenaries, some soldiers, actually. And in comes Domino, who is there to stop Deadpool from getting the information because she's saying that the place he's going to hit is a... Uh, a hospital and it has you know civilian targets non-combatants social workers doctors families with kids and she's like kids deadpool you can't attack this place and of course since it's domino she has her good luck power so things just keep going bad for deadpool um until she lets her guard down and he sets off a grenade and then steals the information and brings it back to the person who hired him and of course deadpool's asking questions like you know why did you choose me for this job and he's like, yeah, well, you know, I know you like money and you're a merc and you, you know, you're a professional. And then Deadpool's like, yeah, and because I'm a bad guy, right? And then, yeah, he kind of agrees with him. So then Deadpool kills the dude, burns the house down with all the information that he stole. I mean, this is a point one. I, my main problem with it was, it's like, we've seen this story like a hundred times with Deadpool. Okay. It, it's not bad. It's just... Okay, I'm spending ten dollars on this book, and you're giving me a story I have seen like multiple times now. Okay, I mean we've been around for a while, so we've been covering Deadpool for how many years? <sighs> Probably twelve at this point, I think. Tunnel of Love, written by Gail. Oops, wrong one. 
No Spider Blues by Steve Fox, Geraldo Sandoval. Well, what, what would you give it? Um, yeah, I think it's a point one. Yeah, it, it's it's not bad. Like the yeah. art is good. It's written well. It's just like I said that for a short story, let alone you know for ten dollars, we've seen this before. Like you did not move the needle. You no, when... you had you had nothing to say because we have seen this like multiple times now. When you throw the price point in there, yes, you, you do definitely have a big point when you throw the price point in there. So yes, um, no spider blues. Steve Fox writing, Geraldo Sandoval artist, but uh, colored by Proto Bunkers, Dono Sanchez Almada. This <laughs> Deadpool breaks into the limbo embassy in New York, which is. Um, led by Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen. <laughs> he breaks in dressed as the Goblin Prince, a.k.a. Havoc's Inferno costume. Um, he makes his way through the demons, killing and slaughtering till he finds Chasm, um, who is the Ben Riley clone who's dropped into some psychedelic goo and had his head messed with. So now he's just this kind of a inverse Spider-Man looking person so um deadpool's in there to kill him um madeline interrupts and you know tries to find out what's going on so she learns that some <laughs> um some henchmen that spider-man had beaten up hired deadpool to kill a bring him the head of a spider-man but because his dominant arm was broken he had the finger type on a keyboard and the spelling is just terrible so um deadpool uses a little loophole to just kind of bring him any kind of spider-man head and not the official spider-man head so madeline sends him back and he brings a demon spider head to kill the henchman uh I, i'm actually gaming this one to party time fruit liquor i thought this was the best one out of all of them this was funny too what oh did, talking about uh what did he call him chasm <laughs> the H, i believe the h is silent go ahead Talking about the Riley Brown thing, did it, or yeah, Riley Spider Man? Mm -hmm. Did did you see uh, the the sequel for Into the Spider Verse? Of course. <laughs> remember, muscles, when, muscles. remember when he appears? It's like I'm dark and gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> that, movie is, what? that movie is fantastic. I had to buy the Blu-ray for it so I can watch the. Uh director's commentary and the special features that that movie is just great uh, yeah. come on now that movie's great well yeah but did you hear about the horrible things that went behind the scenes well i mean man, most animation <laughs> studios have horror stories nowadays anyway but yes i know and uh oh did you i beat spider-man i i plot in a spider-man 2 never played any of them Oh, yeah, it, it connects with it because, you know, he's in the movie. Mm hmm. Insomniac Spider Man's in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a connection in the game. Okay. No, I'm just letting you know. You have to find these spider bots that are from other Spider Verses, and if you collect all of them, the portal opens, and there was a character who was cut out of Spider Verse movie. Mm -hmm. who's like a bartender and you give all the uh spider bots back and it's like oh by the way if miguel comes by yeah you should join up with him okay so prequels to it nice yeah all right tunnel of love written by gail simone with david baldion on art uh, and color photo bunkers dono sanchez amera once again on colors and this was the team of the uh domino series back in the day so in this one, we have uh, Outlaw, Diamondback, and Deadpool who were supposedly in the tunnels, um, the Morlock tunnels, as the Morlocks hired them because something is going on. Um, it's killing them underneath there. So the three of them, Hot Shots, um, face off with some kind of zombie beings. Um, they pretty much knock all of them out as they go deeper and deeper. They get to a point where they have to go through a literal, like, sewer tunnel, and Diamondback's like, uh-uh, not in these shoes. So, uh, Outlaw and Deadpool continue on <laughs> alone through the dark, and when they finally get to the end, they find a dog. And if you've seen John Carpenter's thing, you know how it goes from here, because this thing transforms into this huge 
meat protoplasm monster. Well, you you know who the dog could possibly be, right? Who could the dog be? One of the dogs from Deadpool Paws. Ah. Because they were these dogs that could shape shift and stuff. I do not. I, 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 that's what I was thinking, but then once you mentioned John Carpenter's thing, I was like, I was like, ah, yeah, that makes more sense. But yeah, and it looks just like it. I mean, completely like right from the movie. But it also, but, ha- mm-hmm. yeah. But I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there that also, it, well, I was reading this and it was like this was giving me, yeah, that book, pause, Deadpool, pause, vibes. You know, I don't think I ever really. No, you asked me about it, and I said you should read it, but you should also try to find an audio book because the audio book also is different because it's Deadpool acknowledging his audio book. Nice. Okay. But yeah, so this thing also has a power to where it can like hypnotize people to make it do what he commands. So it takes over Outlaw, and Deadpool literally has to put his backup underwear over his face so he doesn't look at it. And he ends up just shooting up the whole place until he kills it. Uh, and Outlaw is bulletproof, even though it hurts. So she's pissed at him. But then the two of them leave um, the sewers. Come on now, you really you're not gonna you're not gonna gentleman decoy this one. Oh no no, this gets a party time for liquor though. Oh, okay. I thought the art at times when he's drawing like Diamondback mm-hmm. is not the best. It, it kind of gives me like a uh, Humberto Romo Ramos, Ramos vibes, yeah, yeah. Which is, I'm not saying it's bad, but sometimes it's like not consistent. Got you. If that if that makes sense. All right. And... What would you give it? Oh, this one definitely. It's, it's going to get a party time fruit liquor for me. Loved it. All right. Last one. We've got Love at First Slaughter by Mark Guggenheim with art by Wills Potasio. And colors by Arif Prianto. Um, basically, Deadpool gets a call because he uh supposed to be at a job and he completely forgot about. <laughs> and as the story goes through, every time Deadpool gets an idea that he wants to copyright, there's a little trademark application. So the first one is the uh, asinine idea mania, which is for AIM because he's going to an AIM base where they decided to... Uh, experiment with the brood by giving them healing factors. And of course, nothing can go wrong with that. <clears throat> so Deadpool breaks in, starts killing them or trying to kill them, and then he meets some um another superhero named Sanction, who has this kind of uh, whip like weapon. And of course Deadpool is in love <laughs> and he takes a moment out between the panel gutters to do his research um for who this character is. Um and she is also of uh, uh, what is her name? Haraya Vogel. Um, she was screwed over by the CIA and went, went freelance. So she's an assassin of corrupt leaders, um, mercenaries, all that other stuff. So of course he's in love, and she vows to kill him because he's a mercenary and low life. Blah blah blah. But the two of them do have to team up to take down the brood, which they do. And um. At the end of it, she's like, okay, well, you know, I have to kill you. And then Deadpool's like, um, how about we have a comic book superhero fight instead? Um, and the winner gets to have sex with the loser. <laughs> and she's like, fine. <laughs> and then they start fighting. Uh, uh, point one. Point one. I, I was looking it up. I was just curious. If like Will's Portasio like created slapstick, nah. Oh no, I I have no idea why slapstick was in this. Where was slapstick? Literally the first page. Oh, oh. Deadpool's has a slapstick oh, blanket, blanket, a slapstick and... love pillow. Yeah, I don't know. and I'm just like, uh, just so people know, slapstick. <laughs> hey, we're doing a Merc file real quick. <laughs> It brought to Merc file. Why not? Uh, slapstick uh, first appeared in the awesome slapstick number one in November 1992, created by Len Kaminsky and James Fry. Okay. <laughs> Do you really want me to continue? Nope. <laughs> 
I, I think they missed an opportunity for one good joke in here. When Deadpool wakes up and he's climbing out of the bed, they cover his naughty bits with the approved by Wade Wilson authority. They should have done this in two steps. They should have one that's just like um, approved by Marvel Comics or whatever. And then they should have done a longer one in the second panel, which was approved by the Wade Wilson authority. That would have been a good joke. Yo, I didn't know this. Did you know that Slopstick was a mutant X? In the alternative universe of Mutant X, Slopstick was a member of a group of supernatural heroes called the Lethal Legion. Um, mutant X was was a good comic. It was, but I, I don't completely don't remember that. You're dealing with some late '90s stuff there too, so I wouldn't remember. But yes, that was a fantastic book while it lasted. This is from Wikipedia. Slopstick was originally a junior high school class clown, Steve Harmon from New York City. In a plan to get back his <laughs> archival Winston, Steve dresses as a clown to blend in with the crowd at a strange new carnival. But before Steve could enact his plan, Winston and his date, Heather, were kidnapped by several clowns. Steve picks up a mallet as a weapon and falls in. The group enters the carnival fawn house and enters a portal to Sky's... As a mirror, as is closing, Steve follows. The, at the moment of entry, a uh, burst, an energy burst, races across Steve's world, altering the sense of several beings, such as Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, Spider Man, and Howard the Duck. His molecules stretch across 3,741 dimensions, and Steve ends up in the realm of scientists. Supreme of Dimension X, who resembles Groucho Marx. The scientist helps Steve master his new form, a body composed of the living, unstable molecules, dubbed Electroplasma. This essentially makes him a living cartoon character. Hmm. And that's your Merc file on Slapstick. Because no remember nobody when, cares. <laughs> remember when we read the first issue? And we were like, eh. You it's mean, like a point one. We were actually like pleasantly like not disappointed by it. Well, this to to, to why can't I think today? Jeez, I need my coffee. Um, to be specific, we're talking about the Merc with the Merc with a what's the name of the book? Mercs for Money slapstick number one, not the original. Yeah, yeah. And we were like, huh? We were expecting this to be a train wreck. It's a dumpster truck on fire, but it's not a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Deadpool and remember, we walked away with Full Killer being the best, best one. Best one. Yes. <laughs> yes. I do remember. <laughs> and we were, and somehow, Solo, which was Jerry Duggan and what's his face? Phil Noto being the worst one. Damn. I don't remember that. Yeah. But yeah, we blocked it out. We were like, huh. We thought this would have been, like, the best yes. book. After one issue, we're like, we're done. Really? Phil Noto and Jerry Duggan? And it didn't work? Nah. Now you're going to make me want to go back and take a look at that. Because I do not remember it being that... I don't it, it remember was... being that team, either. Huh. Interesting. Anyway, what were you going to say? So, yeah, seven slaughters overall. Um, I think... It, it was... it, it... No, th th this gets a bladder blood. Just because it's $10, once you add that price, it is not worth it. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I mean, if we average the ratings of all the stories without taking into context the price, I think it's pretty much between a point one and a low point one. But you add that price. No, I, I could not in good conscience tell somebody to pick this up. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. We have so much more. To be, just because that was so fucking long. I'm like, oh, man, we're doing rating in the waiting in the review. And I'm like, fuck, we have to do Pastel Vision. This will be quick. All right. We got Marvel Zombies. Oops, I put number one. But this is number two. So, yeah, you're covering issue two, which is written by Robert Kirkman, art by Sean Phillips, colors by Jun Shung, VCs Randy Gentile on letters, Deborah Weinstein on production, Nicole Wiley and John Barber, assistant editors, Ralph Macchio, editor, Joe Casada, editor in chief, Dan Buckley, publisher, and cover by 
Arthur Sudan after Jack Kirby. All right, so we pick up uh, where we were uh, last issue. They saw our Marvel Avengers, which just call them. They saw Silver Surfer, but he disappeared. Uh, Angel says, "Hey, should I go up, go up there? Yeah, you know, fly after him, scout around." And uh, Giant Man says, "No, I don't trust you because you're going to get first dibs and eat them. If you even remotely fly up there, I'm going to clip your wings." Uh, then, so they said, okay, well, we should report back to Iron Man. Giant Man says, hey, I'm going to go find my, uh, find Wasp. Giant Man then shrinks down to normal size. He then goes down to secret entrance. Um, who happens, and then he opens up a container, or who happens to be in it, but it is Black Panther. And I totally forgot about this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow, that totally made sense of why they did this in the What If episode. I totally forgot about this. <laughs> what about you? I didn't. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I totally forgot about this. Uh, yeah, so Hank is cutting off a piece of his leg just so he can regain his... Uh, basically, when the Marvel zombies eat, they then regain your sentience and he's like, okay, if I, you know, eat your leg, I'll be f full. And by then I can actually use, get back to work on trying to develop a cure. But giant man also says, but here's the thing. If I do cure myself, I think I still want to eat human flesh. It's actually really good. Uh, wasp shows up. She says, you know, you're holding out on me. He says, don't tell any, anybody about this because I have a plan. She's like, well, if you give me a piece of T'Challa, then I won't tell anyone. Uh, then we get typical, you know, Hank Pym fashion where he bitch slaps her. Then he bites her head off, spits it out and says, God, we take decomposing meat tastes so disgusting. Uh, Hank then, you know, resedates T'Challa and he walks off. We then have Silver Surfer as he's flying around the planet. So we see zombie Captain Britain, zombie Shuri, zombie Doom. I have no idea who... I don't th think that's Shuri. I don't think Shuri even exists. Well, she might exist at this point, but I can't tell who that is in the planes. It, well, it looks like a female Black Panther. I'll say that. Maybe. Keep going. Sabra. Who's in Israel. Oh, okay. Uh, whoever the fuck that is in the anybody. snow. And then it looks like silver sa zombies. Silver or maybe normal S silver samurai fighting against zombie. Sunfire. Sunfire. Uh, zoom out. They get back to Times Square where we see a bunch of the zombie superheroes. They see... Iron Man, Iron Man does the best. They, they go with the line and say, oh, yeah, we found Magneto, but there was a gas leak exploded. He had a charmed remains. And then the sp <laughs> Tony go zombie Tony goes, hey, Spider-Man, how's that Aunt May and <laughs> Mary Jane? And he goes, oh, I can't believe I ate them. And Luke Cage just goes, oh, fuck this. <laughs> So Iron Man says, you think I'm stupid? He's just like, I know you guys ate. Not only that, you know, we have Banner, not Hulk. Uh, they decide they're going to have a plan in which they're going to get in a Quinjet, fly to the Midwest, and maybe people will come out of hiding. In this universe, we also find out that uh, Colonel America was actually president for one po at one point. Which is kind of cool because this predates before Captain America uh, in the Ultimate Universe when Captain America became president. You know, I didn't remember that until you mentioned it. I felt I left the Ultimate Universe oof, or way early. Anyway, uh, then we kind of get Tony saying, like, hey, at some point, like, we're not going to find any food and then we might start, like, attacking, eating each other. I think it's best now we split up our numbers. Captain America agrees. Then uh, Silver Surfer comes by. Silver Surfer does his whole thing. Hey, I deemed your planet, uh, you know, ready for fees for Galactus. And might not totally feed him because all life here is pretty much dead. But uh, you guys should consider yourself lucky. They decide, hey, food, let's go get him. And that's how the issue ends. This is definitely a like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
these people are just terrible though. But you know, can't blame them. All right, you want to take us into the next? All right, issue three. Same, same creative team. I don't think we need to read all that again. All right, so the fight goes down with Silver Surfer. Um, of course, he's kind of tearing through them. Thor tries. Thor hits him with Mjolnir, and it, the hammer. No, shatters. no, no, no! It's the fake Mjolnir because he's no longer worthy. worthy. So it's just a piece of like cement rock with like w- wire rebar. Yeah, coming out of it. Okay. So but, sorry, I just I just remember just all the cute little things. like sticks that go on, you know, like Captain America having like a bird's nest in his head and shit. So yes, um, Thor gets in a good hit, but of course they really can't handle the Silver Surfer. Even Wolverine tries to cut him, but because his flesh is decomposing, um, his metal, the metal, his bones literally rip out of his skin um iron man gets cut in half and giant man eventually shows up he's like nope I'm not taking part in this i'll let them handle it i i like the thing we have zombie ghost rider and i'm just thinking how did that happen <laughs> did they, they had to had to eat in johnny blaze before he turned yeah infected him before he turned probably um spider-man gets fed up with his loose dangling leg and decides to rip it off um, Bruce Banner gets hungry, so of course he transforms into the Hulk, and where, and uh, <laughs> gets shot in the face by Silver Surfer, who then tries to just leave the battle behind. But Hulk catches up to him and literally bites his head off. Which uh, I don't know if I follow, I don't know if I believe that one, but all right, for the sake of silliness, we'll just go with it. Um, well, I I I I have. Yes, I have Quash. Mm-hmm. First off, is Silver Surfer like indestructible? I, th- I would think so. I mean, I thought he's just a normal dude, but when he's on top of the board, he's like indestructible. No, he doesn't have to be on the board. He's... Okay, I always thought he had to be on the board. Mm-mm. And I've seen parts where he can actually retract the metal and make himself flesh again. I've seen him do okay. that. But, I mean, if Wolverine couldn't cut through it, I'm just surprised Hulk can bite through it. But, of course, they say, you know, you got to peel back the candy coating and Nintendo morsels are inside. So, they all tear up the Silver Surfer um, and start eating him. Um, at one point, the main characters get a bite of him. So, you got Wolverine, Luke Cage, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Cap, um... Uh, giant man. So at one point, Beast and the rest of them come in upset because they didn't get a bite. And Cap tries to uh, basically push Beast back and instead ends up blowing off his head. So then we realize everybody who ate the Silver Surfer now have a piece of the power of Cosmic. No, I love the part with uh, Hercules <laughs> going in the Hulk's mouth <laughs> to get the head. And then, uh, yeah, then Hulk almost smashes his head. So then we switch and we see Black Panther hobbling down the street carrying Wasp's head. And Wasp just keeps asking him for a bite, uh, a little something, some flesh. She's in pain. And he's like, you know, this is all in your head. You don't have a stomach. You don't even have a body. You shouldn't even be hungry. Um, but then they get confronted by the Acolytes, led by Fabian Cortez, who all seem to be human. And... We cut back to the main Marvel zombies who have the cosmically powered one has killed all the other zombies. So it's just them. And then they're going to figure out what to do next. But then, of course, they realize maybe they should have killed everybody because here appears Galactus who acts for his herald, the Silver Surfer. And then the crew decides, oh, we're just going to go and attack Galactus. All right. So you want to hear a funny story? Mm hmm. About the whole thing where Black Panther's telling Wasp, it's all in your head. Mm -hmm. This actually, Robert Kirkman got this from a story from Fred Valente, who was, I think he was with his wife, maybe, or his girlfriend. But, you know, like they're in bed, you know, getting ready, yeah, getting ready to fall asleep. And he was just saying it's like with zombies, you know, sometimes like when you see like a zombie head Mm -hmm. by itself, it's like, how is a zombie head making sound? Like, it has no lungs. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, like, it's true. Like, how's it like? How's it like, talking? No, <laughs> how's it talking? <laughs> and yeah, that's where Robert Kirkman got the idea for this. It's like, you don't have a stomach to digest anything. How are you hungry? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's very true. I know there's going to be one person that's going to be like, well, actually, you know, you still have pockets of air in, like, you know, you know in your mouth for, like, three minutes after decapitation. Anyway. <laughs> it's animated dead flesh, so there, there's all the mystery. You know, right it, it, it's just like, you know, how the fuck is Janet talking? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, can I just say, person. I love this cover. Oh, yeah. What the... So it's a uh, homage I, to Hulk. Shoot, Hulk is that? I don't remember, but it's the one where Hulk's face is reflected in Wolverine's claws. But in both of their mouths are a bunch of eyeballs. Yeah, that's another thing. Wolverine going forth will have eyeballs in his mouth all the time. But uh, no, I actually, my brother bought me this t-shirt way, way back then. I still have to, it doesn't fit me anymore, but I still actually have this t-shirt. Yeah, Arthur Sudom just doing his homage covers. This was a big thing back in the day. 2006. Man, my first kid wasn't even born yet. Still didn't get that puss yet. Oh, I was married by that point, but still. <laughs> um, Yeah, matter of fact, he just got his driver's license. And he's going to be 17 next month. Oof. Watch out, ladies. <laughs> scary anyway um yeah i enjoyed this issue i definitely will give it a like this series oh, yeah. as a whole is just gonna i don't think we're gonna have any dislikes for it at least the first series well we're only covering the first series why are we covering this again uh because we were going to do uh merc with a mouth Okay. And I oh, just yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I just asked, can we do Marvel Zombies? Because Marvel Zombies was so good. And you said, fuck yeah, we can. Yeah, you're right. And it does, <laughs> it plays a little part in there. So yes. <laughs> I mean, that's literally the only reason why we're doing it. Just because <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is so fucking good. And, you know, we, we only got so many, we got so many Deadpool stuff to cover already. So, you know. <laughs> we, we have plenty of time to kill. And talking about that, it's time for Waiting in the Review. Woohoo! We are now uh, in at the halfway mark. Uh-huh. So we have Waiting in the Summer, Episode 7. So we pick up where we left off last episode, where... Uh, I forget the girl's name. Do you remember the girl's name? Ichika? No, no, the old... The girl that they meet. On summer vacation. Oh, the his old high school friend. Um, could, could, I'm going to call her Summer. So <laughs> it begins with a K. Kaito? No, not Kaito. Um, so anyway, so we we get to the point where Kaito uh, shoots down Summer, but Ichika hears uh, Summer's confession to Kaito. She runs off. Meanwhile, uh, Summer's friend. I don't know what her name was let's call her autumn so autumn, <laughs> autumn wakes up terrible and she's like hey where did uh uh where did everybody go so we have meanwhile uh running off we have uh, fuck toro and what's the other girl's name Mio? no um Let me just pull up the characters because I can't remember who's who now. Okay, so you're talking about who now? Toro Tits- and the other woman. Not Kana. Kana's best friend. Okay, so Kaido's the main character. Ichika is the girl from space. Kana is Kaido's friend who likes him. Tetsuro is is Kato's best friend uh, guy friend who actually likes kana mio's the one who likes tetsuro remin we know is just a troublemaker um so which character are you talking about now mio mio okay the new the, okay uh, yes toro mio they run off 
and they're like, oh, you know, thank God you saved me. And she's like, hey, can you just not tell anybody what happened back there? He's like, what do you mean? That I wasn't wearing any underwear? He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. She's like, okay, thanks. We should get back. And he says, maybe you should have a change first. She's like, I gotcha. So uh, everybody appears back at the shoot. Uh, so they're doing the you know, the shoot for it in which uh, Summer, she's holding a gun towards Ichika and she's like, is like, you know, hand over the goods or I'll shoot you, you alien. And while that's going on, they also have like a little side conversation going on. She's like, hey, I saw you just so you know, like, you know, uh, I, I like uh, Kaido, but you like him, too. And she goes, huh? Uh, Remen, she's yells, cut. Autumn shows up. Autumn chases uh, Toro. So they continue filming. They call it for a day. Uh, so then we cut to this episode is actually very Toro heavy. Mm-hmm. So Toro, he's still running off. Uh, Mio shows up to help him hide. They hide. Uh, but then Autumn catches up with them. Autumn is like, come on, you're coming with me. And then Mio finally, she stands up for herself and she's like, no, he's not coming with you. He doesn't like you. Get the hint. And then Autumn goes, what? Because you like him? Oh, that's because you're a fucking ex- expertist. You're a pervert. And she says, I'm not a pervert. I'm just a nudist. <laughs> and now it comes full circle. That's why I keep on telling you, notice what Mio's wearing in this <laughs> in this scene. Mm-hmm. Or take no- and take notice why she's uh, not participating at the beach, because she forgot to wear a top. And all she has on is a hoodie. (laughs) And she basically says, oh, yeah, my parents are nudists and I'm a nudist. And the whole entire thing is sometimes when I'm stressed, I totally forget when I have to go out and I have to wear (laughs) underwear. So that's what's going on. So. uh, Autumn finally gets the hit and realizes Toro doesn't like her. Uh, and that right now Mio and Toro are having a moment, so she runs off. Uh, so Kaido, he arrives at the hotel to talk to Summer. Uh, he gets a letter saying, oh, meet me at this place. Meanwhile, Kana, she's back at the Summer Lodge, and she's just, you know, relaxing, and she realizes, wait, nobody's here. That means only Kaido's here. All right. So she goes into the boys' room and the boys aren't there. And then Remen just randomly pops up. <laughs> and she's like, hey, uh, I know how Kaido feels about you. Oh, you do? Yeah, let's have a little girl time. Here, drink this. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and it's like a Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> oh, uh, meanwhile, Reno, he's still knocked out <laughs> from earlier. There's some questionable shots in this episode. What with Reno? <laughs> Period. Like even the beginning where um Autumn, her name is Chai Chai Chihara. Chiharu. Yeah, when she when they show how he's she's sitting on Reno in that first shot. There's a yeah. Some questionable uh shots in this episode especially. Toes and all. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, so meanwhile, Ichika, she arrives at this shrine, uh, and who happens to be there, but it's Summer, and Summer then basically says, hey, so, you know, like, my boyfriend, uh, he dumped me, and then I just came here just to clear my mind, and then that's when I ran into Kaido, and old feelings came up, uh, so then I confess my love to him, he shot me down, but you know what the thing is? He said exactly what my ex-boyfriend said. There's somebody else that I like That's at why that she moment. Crying. Oh, and, yeah. And it brought up bad memories. And then that's when Ichika starts realizing, I think I like Kaido. Uh, Kaido shows up after summer leaves and Kaido goes, Oh, what are you doing here? And then that's when Ichika goes, yep, I'm in love with Kaido. <laughs> uh, they walk back that night back to the uh summer house 
Uh, they share a moment and Kaido is about to kiss Ichika. Ichika tries to stop him, but she falls for the kiss. And then right before they're about to kiss, <laughs> Kaido shows up in a cat made outfit and goes, meow, meow, what's going on? Totally fucking drunk. We cut to earlier <laughs> where she's like five beers deep. <laughs> and Remen keeps making her dress up in cute outfits. <laughs> We better see like a full cut of this whatever's recorded by the end of this damn series because there's we too do. much. Okay, spoilers, oh. we do. Okay. But <laughs> stupid. But I just love that she's like five beers deep now. So she kisses uh Ichika on the cheek, then she goes to kiss Kaido, and Kaido pushes her away, is like, You're drunk. Uh and Toro shows up with Mio. And we're like, what's going on? We're like, God is uh, out of her mind. So next morning, they finish up the final scenes. Autumn and Summer leave you know, to catch your plane. They clean up the set, and then they have some fun at the beach, and that's how the episode ends, with Ichika going, that's when I realize, that's when I realize, I love Kaido. Okay. Took her long enough, damn it. Um, I enjoyed it. It's a very fun issue. It's been a while since we last watched the last one, so I was really afraid of not remembering everything. But um, no, I caught up pretty quickly and was able to follow with what was going on. I always thought, I mean, besides that we finally got the nudist reveal mm -hmm. or explanation, I always thought it, just for as the series went, this was like the slow part of the series. This episode and so far. Just this arc. This arc. Okay, so The so beach far. arc. Okay. Yeah. I would say this is the one where it's like, okay, I get it. They're just having summer fun. But then it's also, yeah, it's like, oh, well, actually, this is where, like, we start getting the clear pictures of everything. Got you. Yeah, you know, like, Ichika finally realizes, oh, yeah, I'm in love with Kaido. Wait. <clears throat> okay. Um, I don't think I have anything else to really add on the episode. Oh, no, 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 no. And we forgot one last thing. Mm -hmm. Reno finally wakes up and realizes that he sent a distress call. Okay, they didn't quite spell it out. They just show all the warnings and stuff. So it was like, what the hell is going on? Something's wrong is what I got from it. And then we see something flying in space. Right. Something's coming towards them. All right, so... Episode eight. Um, a little bit of time has passed, and um, I want to call him Kaido. What's the main character name? Kaido. Ka Ka Kaido. Kaido. It is Kaido. Um, Kaido is still reminiscing on the almost kiss, and then out of nowhere, Remen has this bright idea. Well, they're all going to go to this festival, Japanese festival, where Ichika finally gets to taste some of the, f you know, food and some of the best parts of the seeing the festival. And then Remen has this wonderful idea to have them visit a shrine at night. However, she did talk to Tets Tetsuro's sister about helping her out with something. So, did, did you catch some of the conversation going on? Which I'm not sure which part you're talking about. With what? When she's having uh, lunch with the sister. No, I didn't catch. She says, oh, you're still a high school student? And she says, yep, I'm, I'm forever 17. 17. Yeah. Okay. I did catch that. I thought, is, is that a literal thing or is that? You'll well, see. We'll see. Okay. Was but they, sure have a his, was they have a history. Okay. Um, so then, yep. Yeah. So then they're going to draw straws to see who which pairings are going to go to this temple at night. And stuff oh, dude, dude, you're like cutting out all this other stuff. What did I... What, the festival? What did I skip? Earlier that morning when they're at the house and he's reviewing the footage. Oh, okay, yes. Sorry, <laughs> I went straight to the thing. Yes. How many, it's like, what is this movie about? I don't know. How many times have you died into this movie? A lot. <laughs> so, Kaido and, and Tetsuro are reviewing the footage and he even brings uh, somebody, um, Re... Rena, whatever her name, brings him some even more footage that just got developed. So Kaido is trying to splice together um, the movie, and then he finds footage of the beginning of the beginning of the series where Ichika's 
uh, ship crashes. So he kind of gets cut off before finish reviewing that footage. But then also him and Tetsuro are filming other scenes with a kaiju attacking, you know, a fake city and the model airplane attacking and, and Tetsuo even coming back as like an Ultraman where he grows the size to fight the dinosaur. So, you know, they're putting in the special effects. This movie is insane. And yes, we get to see the movie. I can't wait to see the final final cut of this movie. Anyway. So then, yes. So they all meet up there and then the festival starts to happen. And then that night, um, Revan tries to pair them up in teams to go into this dark shrine scary at night. Um, I think she well, you, cheated. You also forget that when they're at lunch, we get the love polygon map. Oh yes, yes, she shows the love circle, but nobody. Um, poor Mio. Nobody likes Mio. No, nobody likes Mio, and no one. Remen doesn't like anybody. Well, Remen doesn't fit in the circle, but yes, you you are right with that. Um. So yeah, I think Remen cheated because somehow, um. Mio and Tetsura end up together and uh, Kaito and Kana. Kana? Yeah. Kana end up together. Which leaves um, Ichika with... Was was she by herself or was she with Remen? She was with Remen. She was with Remen. Okay, which leaves her with Remen. So Mio and Tetsuro are the first ones to go in there and they make it all the way to the shrine where they're supposed to leave something behind. Um, Tetsuro's sister pops in and scares the shit out of them. And Tetsuo and Mio end up landing on each other and having a kiss. And all I'll say is there is a reason. I'm just saying, just keep noticing why there's always a discussion with Remen and Ichika. Why they're always being teamed up and they and Remen's like, oh yeah, you're my best friend and everything. Okay. We're, we're, we're getting to the point where, uh... That's why there was that, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you my, to. I'm going to tell you my theory now because of, of this episode, especially. I'm going to definitely run my theory by you. So, anyway, um, so that's Tetsuro and Mio went into the temple. So now, uh, Kaito and Kana are still kind of walking when, um, what's the, what's Ichika's navigator, her thing Rina. name? Rina. Um, comes and tells her, oh, oh, you know, there's a problem with trying to, you know, fix it myself, but we sent a distress signal and they're sending help. So then out of space drops down this big, huge, and this android-like drone that is there to rescue, quote-unquote, Ichika, who's like, oh, crap. Um, she screams, and of course, when Kaito hears the screams, he turns around and just leaves Kana behind. He's like, here, stay it's right here. It's a Federation rescue pod. Yes, the rescue pod. So well, no, I'm just letting you know that it's called a Space Federation Rescue, rescue pod. pod. All right. So then Kana, Kaito ends up leaving Kana behind by herself, which was kind of a dick move. But of course, you know, his focus is on Ichika. So he takes off to rescue Ichika and ends up trying to fight this thing. Um, Rin- Rina, the, the little navigator dude, shows up with a ship. and Reno. Think Rhino? Reno. Yeah. Hey, it's been like four months since I last watched this last episode. Anyway. But yes, um, and then Kaido is doing his best. He actually jumps on the ship piloted by Reno and crashes it into the rescue thing and ends up falling a couple stories once again, busting his head open and just being in a pool of blood. So then Ichika has to come and help him and help um, heal him. And is that where it ends? Yeah, she just keeps saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. So... Now, um, now we're going to talk about, now that you mentioned um, Remen and this whole thing, it's like Remen is really trying to push Kaito and Kana together. And because, and of course, how this movie is going with how close it is to real life, it does seem like Remen knows what's going on. She knows the real story behind, beside, behind Ichika, and she's really just trying to, I guess, save Kaito, the heartache of Ichika leaving and just trying to push him to Kana, and that's what it's looking like. I mean, that's a good theory. So that's what I'm, that's where I'm at so far. Well, I'm just saying I, I can't don't say spoil it. it. Don't spoil Even it. Even if you're right or wrong, I'm just saying I can't say it. Don't say anything because this is intentionally why I have not watched ahead, even though I'm so tempted to sometimes just watch one more episode. 
Um, well, we have four episodes left. I know. Yeah. Well, four episodes in the OVI. Yeah. So I was uh, really tempted to see what happens next, but that's where I'm at so far because Remen seems to know a little bit too much and she doesn't want Ichika and Kaido together. And I just think because she knows that eventually Ichika has to leave or, you know, go back home. So, um, really enjoyed it. Really great series. Really fun. All right. And talking about things that we enjoyed, let's talk about things we enjoyed this year with our end year. Uh, for the books. So last, you want to go over last year's stuff? Okay, let's do one. Let's do it by category as we last year's category, this year's winner. We'll do it like that. Uh, okay. Well, we always say best book for last. So we have okay. best character. Last year, we both said All Might in Deadpool Samurai. <laughs> The year before that was probably Jeff, huh? I think. I think the year before that was Jeff. Yeah, I mean, that All Might appearance was epic. Um, I'm going to pick... This year's pick, I think, is going to be a little different. I think we're probably going to have different uh, picks for this one. I'm going with Princess. I'm going with Jeff. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I didn't want to do Jeff. I was afraid we did Jeff, like, the last two years running, but... Okay. Uh, best writer. Last year, I said Sanshiro Kasuma for Deadpool Samurai. You said Ben Percy for Wolverine and X Force. Yeah. Um, there really wasn't much to work with. Um, Deadpool's appearances in. Well, he appeared in X Force. He appeared in Wolverine again. He even appeared in Uncanny Avengers as a member, which, you know, we're covering on Earth's Mightiest Podcast, which is the other podcast. You might want to check that one out. That was a pretty solid five-issue miniseries. Um, so writers, I mean, there was like, what, three? Three writers, if we really want to look into it. So, I mean, I went with Alyssa Wong. Yeah, I mean, she did the main Deadpool book, and that's the main solid Deadpool thing we had all year. His appearances in the other books, aside from Uncanny Avengers, were pretty sparse. So, I mean, not unless you want to pick <laughs> Can't even say much straight face. You, you can't pick something from the Seven Slaughters. Those are like ten issue stories. <laughs> no, no, no. I was saying not unless you want to pick Rob Liefeld. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I can't even say much straight face. <laughs> uh, last last year, year, I said Martin Kokolo for Deadpool. You said Adam Kubert for Wolverine. Oh, we're talking about art now. Yep. Okay, you jump to art. Um. I really did enjoy the art on Candy Avengers. Um, did we have the same artist through the whole run of Alyssa Wong's Deadpool? I don't know, but I'm going with Luigi Zagaria from Deadpool because he did. I'm going to say Luigi's a man, Sam. Um, Luigi did that amazing, just that one panel of that amazing uh, Victorian house. Did we use for cover from one of the episodes? Do you remember? Yes, I remember the cover. Yeah, I, I just loved that, like, just that one panel. I'm like, oh my god, this is so gorgeous. So that's why I'm going with uh, Luigi Zagaria. All right, so Martin Cocolo did the first five. Luigi did seven through ten. Javier Pena did issue six. I, I mean, Guru Hero, don't get me wrong, they're up there for the Jeff stuff, but... Dude, Pena did some fantastic stuff, even though he only did one issue. I can't get... I, I would love to give it to Pena, but he only did one issue, and that's the issue where um, <laughs> Deadpool and, and... What's-her-name went on the date, and in the background you had all the craziness going on when they were trying to have their date. Uh, Valentine? Valentine. That was... I will agree with you, and I'll go with Luigi, okay. mainly, mainly because the colorist did a lot. It was a lot better. It wasn't as scratchy, and the colorist, I think, made the art look a lot better in his issues as well. But Javier Pena, man, that, even though it was one issue, that was a that was close. That's my close pick. But yeah, All right. I agree with you. For colors, I went with. Near John Menon for Deadpool. You went with Frank Martin Jr. for Wolverine. Last year. Um, I'm yeah. going with Matt Miller. 
He's the who one that did, did Luigi's. Yeah. See, Mori Hollowell did a fantastic job on Uncanny Avengers. I'm going to go with Mori. His stuff is just gorgeous, too. What's this person's name? Mori Hollowell. All right. Uh, so we do, so people know, so we break this up into two different things. So we have best new anime. This is an anime that is debuting its first season. Last year, I had Dress Up My Darling. You had Chainsaw Man. Oh, 2022. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, this was a hard one. Um, there was like at least three that I would have picked. But in the end, it had to go to Blue Eye Samurai on Netflix. It's such a beautiful... First thing, it's it's a CG, CG animated, but it still looks 2D. It is gorgeous. But more than anything, the story is just fantastic. It has some great twists and turns. Some of it's obvious, of course. But dude, the action is over the top the music is great they even have a cover for um oh shit what is the name of the song um whom the, for whom the bell tones by metallica they have a japanese cover on it that is just as soon as it started playing i was like oh shit i know this song scott you've got to watch it. it's eight episodes you watch it in a weekend completely worth it it is fantastic Okay, and uh, I only completed one whole anime this year. Okay. So, so I have the angel next door spoils me. <laughs> it's not really even that good, but it's the only one that I actually completed. So, <laughs> what, so uh, what kind of honorable mentions that you had that you at least watched a portion of? Uh, the devil is a well. I can't do the devil is a part timer because that would be ongoing. A lot of the other stuff were ongoing. Okay, so nothing that's new. All right. Yeah. Best ongoing. I had One Piece. You had Overlord. Oh yeah. Which I hope they come back soon for that one. Um. So this one. Um. No surprise, probably to you. Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm telling you, through and through. Scott, Shibuya arc, nonstop. They keep raising the bar with the action and the fighting. Literally, two thirds of the damn season is just battles upon battles upon battles, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And nobody is safe. Nobody is safe in this series. And it's just. Oh, some of it's kind of depressing, but. They raise the bar, and the animation for it is just ridiculous. Again, can't go wrong with JJK for sure. Uh, so I am going with One Piece again because we finished up the Wano arc. <laughs> the Wano <laughs> arc, the arc that was longer than World War One. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> but let me tell you, this year we got we got fifth gear. Luffy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, you know, we got like the finale of all the fights, you know, spoilers for in case people are waiting for like the dub to finish up. But, you know, we got like fifth gear Luffy versus Kaido. We got that fight finally ending. We got kid and law both defeating big mom. Okay. I, these are like the big, big villains. Villains. Yeah, we got all the we got all the big reveals about Wano. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, this was such a great like season. Okay. All right. Do you have any honorable mentions? Anything that you uh that came close? Uh, probably Devil is a part timer. I enjoyed it too. It wasn't as good as the first season, but I enjoyed it. Um, let up me next. Oh, there's something we else. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say the next category. Uh-oh, what's the next category? Best non-Deadpool comic. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Um, Before that, did you have any other honorable mentions for, like, new anime? No. All right, so I'm going to say 
Berserk of Gluttony. Check that one out as a new anime for last year. And ongoing Eminence and Shadow. Second season. I don't know. It's just a silly. It's so stupid sometimes. But I just love that damn show. So honorable mention for best ongoing. All right. Well, you know what? It'll probably win this year for best ongoing. What? ReZero, baby! We're back? It should be back this year. Yeah. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I just wanted to come and be here because I don't want to be there, down. There's a time jump. Okay. N- not a big one. It's like, I think it time jumps by like two or three months. I think once I know when it's coming out, I think I'll probably start rewatching the second well, half of season two, maybe. This maybe time. maybe they'll do a, another director's cut. Oh, that's true, too. All right. So we have best non-Deadpool comic last year. <laughs> Gotta you gotta love lab. these. You gotta love these manga titles. Okay. Last year, I had. Does a hot elf live next door to you? <laughs> <laughs> you had immortal X Men. Oh shit. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> oh, what was that? Oh shit. <laughs> Did immortal X Men go bad or something? No. Quite the opposite. It got even better. So, what are you giving it to? Oh, shit. Um, let me take another look at my list because it was going to go to Immortal X-Men again, but I, I don't want to do the same thing two years in a row, but... Um... No, I'm going to have to stick with that, if I'm being honest. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Immortal X-Men. I mean, Karen Gillan is just... He's been rocking that series, and each issue is kind of centered around one of the... The um, the Quiet Council, one of the members of the council who leads Krakoa. And each issue kind of focuses on one of them. You get into their heads, and it, it's just been some solid world building. And the reveals... I, um, X-Men Red comes really close considering switching well, let me see which issues are X-Men Red because I know I say this every episode but Scott you can't sleep on these X-Men books this Krakoan era has been fantastic I saw this one article recently where they're talking about oh man yeah, Krakoa is so good they're learning their lessons from the past and how they're going to end this arc with another genocide arc <laughs> And they're not learning their lessons from the past. No, not quite. Not not quite. They they were attacked, yes, but not, not everybody's gone. They, nobody really. People don't really no, know. No, no, but really they're they're on. doing the same thing they have always done. Mm, not quite. It's different. It's different. The bad guys got their shit together, which is never a good thing. But yeah, I'm going to go with Immortal X Men still. Um, Red comes a close second, but. Just the reveals and everything that's been happening in those books for Immortals just been way too good. Uh, I am going with Worlds and Harem. You know, I started that. I think I got like the second episode. Ooh, yeah, don't, don't, don't. The, the, well, first off, if okay. you're watching it on Crunchyroll, you are getting the unbearable version. Yeah, well, it, the anime adaptation still isn't very good. <laughs> I believe you. Because they, they cut a lot out. Okay. But the book is so good. I Because they essentially, the new year has started, I guess you want to call it like season two mm-hmm. of the manga. So it has been kicking into high gear. I will give an honorable mention though, which was really good. But then it had one bad volume, but there was World Ends Harem Fantasia. And that kind of wrapped up its like first arc, and I thought, "Ooh, that was really good." Except for that one volume where nothing happened. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to do our? <laughs> we used to call a kill shot. Now it's bad <laughs> bladder blood. Or do you want to do best Deadpool book? Uh, let's just we'll do bladder blood so we can at least end on a good note because we, we. I mean, the name is there. Is it really a surprise what the worst thing was this year? Well, you know, it's bladder blood, but I'm just putting it out there. 
after reading uh, his entry in S- Seven Slaughters, <laughs> should we put a hyphen anything Rob Liefeld touches? <laughs> No, hold on. Let me think. Let me think. Um, <laughs> well, no, he didn't do decoy, which was, which was the original. No, 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 no. I'm saying for this year, what was the worst thing? And I'm oh. saying, should we do bladder blood slash anything Rob Liefeld? Liefeld. Does? Yeah, yeah. We could just say Rob Liefeld. I I agree with that. Congratulations! This is like the third or fourth time Rob Liefeld has made this category. I think one year we just had Liefeld tweets. <laughs> yes, we did. That sounds familiar. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, we have best Deadpool book. So, just because we only had one on going. I decided uh, we could put all the miniseries and one shots in here as well, um, but I, I, I think this one's pretty obvious. Yeah, how many, how many miniseries and things did we have? There wasn't. Yeah, Jeff the Shark, Seven Slaughters, and Bladder Blood. Yeah, along with the Core Deadpool book. Yeah, come on, it's gonna have to go to the Core Deadpool book. As good as Jeff the Shark is, too. It was nowhere as good as this last Deadpool run. Yeah, agreed. All right, so just a recap for everybody. Best Deadpool book, Deadpool. Best character, Corwin said Princess, Scott said Jeff the Shark. Best writer, Alyssa Wong. Best artist, Luigi Zaria. Colorist, Corwin said Maury Hallwell for Uncanny Avengers. Scott said Matt Miller for Deadpool. Best new anime. Corwin said Blue Eye Samurai. Scott said The Angel Next Door spoils me. <laughs> you just gotta love some of these anime titles. Almost definitely. Uh, best ongoing anime. Corwin said Jujutsu Kaiden. Scott said One Piece. Best non Deadpool comic. Corwin said Immortal X Men. Scott said Worlds and Harem. Bladder Blood <laughs> goes to Bladder Blood slash anything Rob Liefeld touches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will save that and we will come back. Oh, before we go, just one quick prediction I want to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, because by the time we'll record, it may or may not have happened. I am predicting a Dipple 3 trailer at the Super Bowl. Ooh. You in or out on this? <sighs> when is Super Bowl? February? Uh, the So... The first weekend of February is when I'm at Setsukon. The next weekend is Super Bowl weekend. Okay, second. And the movie's airing when? July 25th, I think. Even if even if it's like a te- even if it's like a teaser. I'll give so you, you think odds. So you think we'll get a the pull three trailer? Yeah, 50/50. Trailer slash teaser? Yeah, 50/50. I'll give it give you that. Okay. All right, yeah, I have to look. We might be doing Monty's predictions next episode. We might not be. I have to see if it's been six months or not. Oh, okay. But other than that, uh, good night, everyone. Hulk here with a new PSA. Did you know that a crocodile cannot stick out its tongue? And now you know. Do-do-do-do!